Well, I'm Pastor Ryan. Welcome to Calvary. It's good to have all of you here, guests, uh, church body, uh, believers, people who've been here for years. Congratulations, partners, for joining us. Really, it's more our, our privilege and honor that we have more and more people every, every month joining Calvary to help us accomplish the mission. And today, I have a, a, a difficult task because I have so much I want to get off my heart, and I'm introducing a series so I want to help you uh, understand what this series is about briefly, and then I'm going to get into our first uh, point of our series, which is about reaching or the word reach. And uh, today we're starting a new series called Church According to Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? Wouldn't that be a really good uh, question to ask is like, you know, Jesus, what kind of church do you want us to be? You know, not, not what everyone else is doing or not what, what the world says to do or, or American churches and what American churches say to do, but, and not what like a, a man wants to do either, not what Pastor Ryan wants to do, but what does Jesus want the church to be and do? It's an interesting question, isn't it? When I look at scripture, I want to look at, you know, what did Jesus mean by being the church and what did he mean by being a follower of Christ. I think that's so important. And I have some key words up here. They're on there on purpose because I believe the church is a disciple-making movement. I'm going to explain what a disciple is in a moment. The church is the body of Christ. The church is actually without walls. This is a building. But ladies and gentlemen, guess what? You are the church. And it is through us that God had a grand dream to save the world. Through Christ being the body of Christ, right? And then through us. So Jesus first, amen? amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We have to read this as a, just a foundational scripture for the church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you know this as the great commission. How many of you know Jesus didn't say it's the great suggestion? No, it was the great commission. It was a mission, and he commissioned his followers, the few that followed him. And actually, more than just 12 began to follow him. Uh, we have a good crowd of about 72 or so. Um, but what we have is he's talking to his faithful followers, his disciples here, and he's telling them, and this is before he's leaving. Uh, so he's, he came back from the dead, he resurrected, and he's hanging out with them for 40 days. And so whatever he's saying is probably really important, right? And so this is one of the last things he said before he ascended up into heaven to be with his father, before he would come back one more time to bring us home to be with him in the new heavens and new earth. And this is what the scripture says. Uh, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's interesting. All authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples, which means a new convert, someone who gets saved or someone who believes in Jesus. Teach these new disciples. Notice, notice that Jesus says new disciples. He doesn't say new Christians. He says new disciples. He doesn't say new believers either. Someone who's a disciple, someone who got saved, someone who believed in Jesus Christ. And he's saying teach these new people who believed in me. They're called disciples Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Wow. That's the mission Jesus gave his church because his church was the followers of Christ. His church was these 12 disciples and then the ladies that helped out as well, the women and the, and the other men that we don't necessarily get all the stories about that were with him. He's telling them to go and make disciples. So no matter how far removed we are from the first century, no matter how long it's been since Jesus gave us the great commission, this still is the mission of the church. 
Now, church can be done in many different ways. You know, there's different styles of churches and, and all that. But when it comes down to it in the end, Jesus gave the church one mission in particular, and that is to go make disciples. In other words, so let's get into that. What is a disciple? A disciple is a convert, a learner, an imitator, or follower of Jesus. There's many words that can be used for that. But what happened in the, in the first century time is that the Jewish rabbis would have a few people follow them and they would learn everything they can about this teacher. So Jesus came, comes on the scene and he does the exact same thing. He's like, follow me. And so he begins to create his own following and he calls these men to follow him. And so now they're a learner, they're a convert to the way Christ thinks. And so as we believe in Jesus, we're actually a believer or a convert to what Jesus thinks. Do we understand that? And by the way, in the Jewish times, in the Jewish understanding of the word believe, it wasn't just the intellect thought of, let me believe that Jesus is real. No, belief meant conviction. It meant put on a new nature, put on a new self, put on a new way of living. That's what it meant to be, to believe in Jesus was, I believe in Jesus so much that I won't do what I used to do and I'll do whatever Jesus says to do. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. That's why when you truly believe in Jesus, your life should really look different. It should look different because you're taking on the way of Christ rather than the way of Ryan, myself, or rather your way. And so shouldn't the church also look like Jesus? Shouldn't the church look like Jesus as well? If, if we are the church, then we must look like Jesus. Of course, this building doesn't look like Jesus, right? <laughs> it's brick and mortar. So we have to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Can you guys tell I get a little excited about this topic? This series is going to be interesting because I, my heart just beats for this stuff. It beats for the life of Jesus Christ. God challenged us many years ago to be a disciple-making church. That's actually why I believe that God has instilled this in my heart more and more, because Calvary has always believed that we're a disciple-making church. I want to show you some slides that we found in pastors. Uh, we didn't take a, a photo of his files. We actually had to put them on a screen for you. But check out some of these things we found in Pastor Kuhn's files of his, his vision statements. Our core values is people for whom we nurture and care, discipleship, so we grow in training, and in integrity in how we function. There's that word discipleship. Go to the next one. Calvary Assembly of God is a community of caring people living out the priority of God's word through dynamic worship, preaching, teaching, and sharing, discovering and developing our abilities, training and service opportunities, encouraging one another, and I love that last one, reaching beyond our walls. Amen. The next one, our purpose is to adore God, reaching up to God. You heard pastors say this not too long ago in our, in our sermon. Bible, reaching in for nurture and discipleship. Community, reaching around for fellowship. Devotion, reaching through to prayer, Bible, and service, and evangelism, reaching out for reaching lost. Wow, we have not changed. That's our heart here at Calvary. And I think we have one more. Our goals, I love this. This was before... I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is before I was born. Right? This is before I was born. To be a disciple-making church. That's what pastor has in his heart. To be a disciple-making church. But you know what? It's not pastor. It's God, isn't it? I mean, we just read one of the last things that Jesus told his followers is to go and make disciples, to go help other people follow me. And that's a really simple definition of a disciple, a person who follows Jesus and helps other people follow Jesus. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, so we should as well, to allow believers to grow spiritually into the image of Christ through the preaching, teaching, and modeling of the word of God. And then he even has the scripture verse, therefore, go and make disciples. So, wow, that's awesome. I think that was the last one, if I'm not mistaken. Cool. So Jesus himself made disciples. It's not like Jesus said, hey, I want you to go make disciples. I didn't show you any way to do that. Uh, have fun figuring it out. No, 
Jesus' life with his few, with his church, he started on the basis of making disciples. He started it. Why? He wanted to show them how to actually do this so that when he ascends to the Father and they're still here, they can take over. So let's look at that. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. We'll have it on the screen as well. I like to call this the first church gathering. This is the first church. This is when they first got together and started hanging out. And by the way, the first thing that Jesus does after he he announces that he is here to minister in the temple, he reads a scroll, he reads scripture from Isaiah, and then he begins to form a team. He begins to form a group, like his own small group. And, And really, they're the church. And this is what it says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Now, there are scholars that say they've heard about Jesus multiple times before they just dropped their nets and followed him. They, his reputation got around as he began to minister to people and teach people. He goes on to say, a little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come, too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. First of all, I just want to bring some attention to something. Uh, Look who Jesus called. His first disciples, he called four fishermen. He didn't go to the temple and find the wisest priests and leaders in the temple that knew everything about the scriptures. He called ordinary, everyday fishermen who, to be honest with you, were probably rough around the edges. They, they probably knew if, if they're Jew, they're from, they're from Galilee, they're Jews, so they probably knew the Torah, they probably had to memorize a lot of it, but it's not like they purposely tried to live it out every day zealously and, and, and trying to be super spiritual. These men were not super spiritual. So if any of you say, I can't be a disciple of Jesus, I can't reach people, Jesus goes, sorry, you can. <laughs> not even sorry. Guess what? You can. Like, we'll count ourselves out first. Like, we'll say, I, I'm not worthy to do anything for Jesus. And it's just not true. And by the way, he didn't just, like, throw them in the fire right away. It was pretty soon as you read the Bible. But he gave them three years to grow as well before he left them. How does a church make disciples? Well, this is where I want to get to our first ones, that we begin to follow the pattern that Christ has. And, and what I see here is, is Jesus did, he, re, he was reaching these men, and he reached anyone around him that he could to convert them and to make them disciples of Christ. And so I want to show you these, these five uh, core values that we're going to go through in this series. And the first one is reach, connect, grow, empower, and go. And the first one we're going to cover today is reach. A disciple-making church reaches the lost. Now, you heard Pastor just recently preach about this because it is who we are as a church. This is not just who we are as a church. This is what a disciple-making church does. This is what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus reached these men, and this is what he did in the following. He calls them to himself. Just go to verse Verse 19, real quick, therefore, go and make disciples. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse 19. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. He calls them to himself when he says, follow me. So a disciple is someone who follows Jesus, who's focused on him, and then he says, he says, I will make you. So just in one short line, he gives us three important things of what a disciple does and who they are. And he says, I will make you. You know what that is? That's growing and being empowered and being transformed to be a disciple of Christ. 
So the first task for all of us is to follow Jesus, to not follow our ways or follow anyone else in this world, but to follow him. And when we do that, when we are reached and we are connected with Christ, then we begin to grow and be empowered by the Holy Spirit, empowered by his training and his giftings so that we can do what? So that we can go and make disciples. So he's calling these men to follow him, and then he's like, I'm going to make you, I'm going to transform you to be a fisherman of people. It's interesting that he uses fish because they were fishermen, right? So we speak in their lingo. But he's saying, I want, to re- I want you to reach people. I want you to gather people, not fish. The last one he says, he, I say here is he calls them to reach people, fishers of men to go with him and reach the law. So in one line, we actually have our five focuses, our values of making disciples, and the strategy to make disciples. So when you're reaching people, you're calling them to follow Jesus. So you get connect, they get connected, right? And they become believers that believe in Christ. And then you're helping them grow and be empowered so they can go and make disciples. That's the process that Jesus gave us And that's the process that we see in this scripture. But I want to focus on one part of the scripture in particular today, and that's the reaching part. What I see in this scripture is that the heart of Jesus burns. It burns to reach the lost. I mean, think about this for a second. He says, come follow me and I will make you a building. Come, follow me, and we'll go to the temple to worship all day, every day. He doesn't, does he? I mean, look at the heartbeat of Jesus here. It's his first call to his followers, and he says, come, follow me, focus on me, and then if you do, I would transform you to gather lost souls. Not sit in the temple every day to worship all day and take communion all day like that's going to save anyone outside the temple. No. Jesus was like, help me reach the lost. Come, follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Church, what has happened to the church of America? What has happened? It's not good. I mean, yes, there's some great things happening and the church is actually, is doing, is pretty healthy, but what statistics are showing is a lot of unbelievers aren't necessarily coming to Christ. Churches are just swapping people. They're swapping believers, they're they're, they're trading followers. But when it comes down to it, uh, statistically, we are not reaching the loss. Instead, atheism is on a rise. Agnosticism is on a rise. What they call nuns, N-O-N-E-S, is on a rise. I mean, our churches are getting healthier. But we have to start looking outside these walls and going, what are we going to do? Because that's how Jesus started the church. That was, that was what made his heart beat was the people that you go and see at Walmart or, or at Popeye's because you're competing with Chick-fil-A now. How shame. That's a shame. That's just wrong. Don't, don't compete with Jesus' chicken. You guys don't do that. Right? Yeah. It's messed up. Shame, shame. I just got really hungry. Confession. I haven't been to Popeye's yet. I don't want to. I don't want to to cheat. Wherever we are, your workplace, your workplace, it's funny because people are like, if I go to church, I'll find Jesus. Listen, if you go to your workplace, you'll find Jesus. I I want us to be that Jesus out there, like that Jesus with skin on, you know, like Jesus. We're not Jesus ever. But to show Jesus where we are, that's the heart. I mean, he literally says, I will make you fishers of men, gatherers of people. That's the heart of our Lord and Savior. That's what dominated his heart. And by the way, 
Well, I already said that, so I'll stop. <laughs> I have, a, I have a deeper question, and this is going to sting for us as a church, maybe. Look, as a pastor, I'm looking at our own church. I'm looking at myself, okay? And a lot of times, I think we in American Christianity think that revival is what takes place in here. I got a, I got a question for you. Where does revival happen? I was talking to a young adult about this. It was a fascinating conversation. Because the revival that people think is if we, if, if we have awesome worship set in here and, and people are on their faces crying out to God and stuff, that, that that's revival. Now listen, I think that's a part of revival. But we cannot go that if you fill the pews, that's revival because Jesus had 5,000 plus people follow him and then they all betrayed him except for a few. Those are just fans and not followers, right? Where is revival? Well, I, I think I've found some key scripture to help us understand this. If we go to Acts 2, 42 through 47. Acts 2, 42 through 47. This is the first church after Jesus ascends. And we, and we see a, a healthy church here. But there's something that's not revealed in the scripture that well. Acts 2, 42 says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. So that would be like listening to the pastor and to fellowship. Notice the word devoted, by the way. They weren't like flaky followers of Christ. They were devoted. And to fellowship, so they were devoted to each other and to sharing in meals, inclu including the Lord's Supper, and they were devoted to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God, not lifting each other up, praising God, and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, and then each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You know, when I was looking at the scripture, God, God pressed something on my heart for us to see. It says that the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. But it doesn't give us any examples of their reaching in this paragraph, does it? It's because you have to read before and after that the church, if you read after this scripture, even, uh, even before this when Peter boldly he boldly proclaims the word of God and the church begins to boldly proclaim in love. They were a community of love. So they had this balance of grace and truth and they led with grace and they led with love and they shared truth with everyone around them. And that's why people were being added to the family of God every day. But we don't see that in that portion of scripture. You have to keep reading but what's interesting is it says in verse 44 and 46, all the believers met together. But what about the unbelievers? It doesn't say anything about what the unbelievers were doing. It's because the unsaved, the unbeliever, didn't gather at the temple. Sometimes they did. Sometimes they were moved by God and they would go to the temple. It's actually something that God wanted is that believers or people from all nations could come to the temple, worship God, and be converted. That is his heart. You can read that in the Old Testament. But here's the thing. The unbelievers didn't come to the temple because they had to be gathered out there in the world. They had to be collected. They had to be gathered. They had to be loved. And you know, it makes sense because they're lost. If you don't have Christ, you are lost. It's not like necessarily a, a, a loss like I was lost in the grocery store one time. It could also mean this, that they don't know what to do or where to go. Here, confused, unsure, uncertain, doubting. And they need someone to show them the way. And so we don't see the church, uh, you know, you don't see the word unbeliever in that paragraph because it was what they were doing outside of their gatherings. 
they would go and reach the lost, and then they would bring those people into their fold, into their fellowship. They would connect them. That's our second core value for next week. And they would get them connected to the body of Christ. <laughs> Revival is when the church goes out to reach and save the lost church. Revival is when we go out and we reach and save the lost. It's, it's in here that we get to see the fruit of us reaching. Do we understand that? It's not that we can't bring someone who isn't a believer to church. I invited unbelievers in our video this week to come so they would say, if you're in here today and you don't believe in Christ, I'm hoping you're hearing his heart for you right now. But listen, this is not our primary way of bringing the lost into the family of God. Why? Because this is an, only an hour and 15 minutes. And the, and the command was teach these new disciples. I think the word teach means something more than just a quick message. I believe it means relationship. It means being able to sit down with someone and explain the wonders in the word of God. Amen? Amen. I'm still excited. Can you tell? Most of the revival work takes place outside these walls, and then the fruit is seen in here. And listen, I don't see the unsaved or the unchurched or non-believer lining up every week to come in here. Do you? No. I wish. But the reality is we are supposed to go where they are. I love... Uh, what Jesus showed the disciples one time when he went fishing with them, they didn't stand on the shore and ask the fish to come into their nets, did they? You guys would be like, Darwin's real. Little legs walking, Darwin's theory is right. No, listen, fish were not gonna just flop into their nets from, from the deep waters into their nets on the shore, were they? No, Jesus said, let's take the boat out deeper and let's cast out that net again. And he was trying to show them that this is what you're going to do. We have to leave the safety of our shores, the safety of just this service, and we have to go out and say, I'm going to reach the lost where they are. That's why we do our ministries that reach outside these walls. And you know what's really amazing is when we do our Easter and Christmas play, what an awesome opportunity where the lost can come in here. And for a moment, they, they are, they're getting direction and they're getting help. And even when we feed, I mean, Margaret, I, it might be even more now, but I'm just going to use what I heard a year ago. We, we're feeding 70-some people a week. The way Margaret and her team run is probably way more than that. But we're, we're feeding people so that we can share the love of Christ and share the good news of Jesus with them every week. And thank you for giving. We couldn't do that without your giving. And honestly, we, we need to do more of, of this reaching. And we're excited for this new renovation of our building uh, for the benevolence. And I'm excited for that. But we, we're not done. We have so much more we get to do. It's so cool. That's exciting. So we're doing reaching. But listen, I, I, had a, I have a home group at my house right now on, on uh, Wednesday night. I'm training up group leaders to lead groups. And it was awesome. I just asked, how was your week? And they went around in a circle sharing how they're reaching people in their workplaces. I was like, praise God. Hallelujah. I mean, it was awesome to hear some of these stories. You guys are doing it. Listen, it says in, in Matthew 28, verse 20, after he says, go and make disciples, it says, and I will be with you until the very end of the age. Do you know where God is with you? He's with you when you're reaching the lost. He's not just in here. He leaves with you. And every time you're ready to bring up the word and bring up Jesus to someone, guess who's right there with you by his spirit, the Holy Spirit? God. He's going to give you the words to say. He's going to give you the creativity, the love to show. He's going to do something because it's what his heart beats for. It beats for the lost in our world. So I don't want to harp too much on, on that because I believe, I believe in this Sunday morning. But in fact, right now you're in discipleship training. <laughs> you're in discipleship training. I am discipling our disciples. 
um, helping you learn and grow so that you can go out and reach the lost. And when they give their life to Christ, by the way, I had the first conversion in my, in my new office. That was pretty cool. This young lady, 24, messages my wife and I on Facebook randomly, writes us a book, it was an awesome book, of her story, how God has been getting her attention. And she says, can, can, can we talk? I want to get baptized. The next day, she's in my new office, which is really kind of, a, it's kind of neat. It was my first day in the office. And the first day, God is like, guess what? This office is going to reach people. <laughs> Amen. And this young lady confirmed her relationship with Christ with me. She had started to believe, but we prayed together that she would follow Jesus. She confessed Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So her leader, her master, and her Savior. And now she's following Jesus, and we're helping her. We're discipling her. You know, the world knows what building to go to for help about God and and things. They know it's the church building. But I want Delaware to know they can come to us. That you are the church. Think about that for a second. The actual church. The physical face and body of Christ that can say, you are loved. Because if I was an unbeliever right now, and I walked up to this building and it wasn't open, it's not going to say, I love you. And our reaching in an hour and 15 minute service, but today might be more like an hour and 20, just a heads up. Um, (laughs) Our reaching in this moment is not enough for Jesus. Do you think that God is more creative than this building and wall, these walls? Do you think so? Yes. (laughs) Yes. He, I mean, the stories I heard was a variety of stories Wednesday night in my house and how People are reaching people in their workplaces. It was so cool to hear. This is the conviction I have here for our church. I I want us to go to them, and I want to be a church that loves Delaware up close. Remember that. Write that down. I want to be a church that loves Delaware up close, not just from in here, but out there. Up close, which is not very comfortable for all of us, but that's a stretch sometimes. But listen, this is, this is a conviction I have as well for Calvary. We are the church, and we are God's greatest reach. We are the church, and we are God's greatest reach. I'm about to show you something that really means a lot to me. I need to get it out today. I was thinking about saving it for next week. I'm going to do it today. But one more thing. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 talks about how we're the light of the world. And I, and I had this scripture in my mind. I'm like, God, what is this about? And... and as I'm looking it up, I'm like, wow, that's so cool. It talks about you don't put a bowl on top of a light, right? You know what God showed me as I was praying? That Calvary, Calvary's roof is like a bowl. And we need to take off the roof, so to say, spiritually. And we need to be the light in the world. I want to show you this board here. In 2017, God started to put on my heart that we begin to reach Delaware through our homes. It was burning in me so much that I made a slide presentation and I emailed it to my mom and dad. So I actually have proof of it, 2017. And the words I wrote on there is Jesus in every neighborhood. It was an audacious big vision. Jesus in every neighborhood. Can you imagine that? Fast forward to when God um, called me to be the lead pastor here. I was writing out my heart and my vision for Calvary. And for some reason, the numbers 2020 kept coming up. But it wasn't for the year 2020. That just happened to be a really cool connection and coincidence later. God kept saying 2020. I was like, man, I know I've heard my dad say something about Acts 2020. So I looked it up. And Acts 20, 20 says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. That's Acts 20, 20. So you guys elected me to be the lead pastor on Sunday night, back in June 9th. On June 11th, I'm traveling down to the beach to have some family time. 
and I get a text message. I'm at the beach, actually, and I get a text message from my sister-in-law, Jen, and they were cleaning out the shed, our benevolent shed, and, and the storage for CCA. And she sent me a picture of this. This is actually over 25 years old. Pastor constructed this over 25 years ago. A vision to reach Delaware through our homes. I had the privilege of dusting it off and cleaning it because God is resurrecting this vision in this season of Calvary. Everyone who has a hard time with personal relationships just got scared. I get that. But God can give you the power to do stuff you never thought you could do. And sometimes it's not for everyone. Okay, We all have our different giftings and abilities that we need to operate in. Some of us, like me, are more social, more open up the home and be hospitable. Some aren't. But God, is, it's cool. This, this was made over 25 years ago. We, we can't really nail how, how long ago it was. But it says, reaching Kent County with 2020 vision. By the way, it's, guess what the year is coming up, right? And it has all the towns in Delaware. And the thing is, is this isn't just a, a, an accident. God gave me this vision years ago, and then someone came up to me and prayed for me during a night of worship, prophesying over me that I was looking over the map of Delaware with leaders trying to strategize how we're going to reach Delaware. That's God. Amen. When I mean prophetic, I mean this person had no idea what God put on my heart back in June. No idea. She comes out to me and prays for me. I can tell she's get, she has a word from God for me. I ask her, what's your word? What, you have something for me. What is it? And she said, I saw you like, like you were a general looking over a map of Delaware and you were strategizing how to reach Kent County. Wow. It was days later we would find this in a storage. I've never seen this in my life. You know why? That's God. Amen. That's God's plan to reach yeah. Delaware. One, one more plan, right? In the, in the months to come, you'll hear ways of how you can become part of this vision. I want, you to, I want us to, as a church to pray about this. This is just one more way to reach Delaware because we have some fantastic ways we're doing it. And then we have something we want to give our church today. Uh, we believe in helping you become a disciple of Christ, to be a learner, a student of Jesus Christ. And so you will be emailed today. And if you don't have your email to our church yet, please take your connect uh, pathway that you have, the bulletin you have, and write your email in there in your attendance sheet. We're going to send you this free gift um, today around 1130 or so, unless we don't have your email, to help you grow as a disciple. Why don't you check out this video of what we mean? Our church is a light in the darkness, a city on a hill. Every believer is called to make a difference in the world to love God completely, and to make disciples of every nation. But in this busy, mobile, noisy world, it can be difficult to even do the basics, to pray, to read the Word, to bring the love of God to our marriages, families, neighbors, and coworkers. We know you're here because you want to be a part of God's mission on the earth. You want to experience the abundant life that Scripture talks about. You're looking to connect your faith to every part of your life every day of the week. That's why our church is subscribing to Right Now Media and making it available for free to every member of our church. You'll have access to over 10,000 online Bible study videos on parenting, marriage, finance, discipleship, leadership, and many more. The videos can be used in Bible study groups or for personal devotion. There's also a huge library of safe biblical kids videos. We'd love to see every member of our church utilizing Right Now Media. Small group leaders leading their adult or youth groups through engaging Bible study series. Children enjoying safe programming that doesn't just entertain, but helps lay a strong spiritual foundation. Families spending quality time together, going through devotional Bible studies. Couples using biblical studies on marriage, parenting, and finance. Applying God's Word to every area of their lives. There is something for everyone. We want to help you grow as a disciple of Christ, and we want to help you become a disciple maker 
in your home, your school, your workplace, your neighborhood, in whatever mission field God has called you to. We believe that this free resource will help equip and unleash you to live out your faith in every area of life, to experience God-centered, abundant life, not just on Sundays, but every day. We are for you, and God is for you. He wants to empower you every day to live for Him. Together, we can be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill. How cool is that? Yeah. So uh, you can go to the next slide. I want to show you. Um, I mean, we're talking over 20,000 videos. This is like uh, Netflix for Christian resource. And it's incredible. So check out this, uh, this next slide. You can see a way to connect even now if you want. Oh, here's our kids. I mean, the kids program, my kids and I have been watching it. It's been incredible. Uh, my son and I just watched one uh, the other night as well. And here's two ways you can join even right now if you want. You can go to our website, calvarydover.org backslash resources, or you can text right now, Calvary Dover. So you would put in the, uh, the person you're texting, the number is 41411, and then you actually write the text right now, Calvary Dover. So that's how you can get this free resource for you uh, to, to help you grow as a disciple and as a family and us as a church. We're just gonna be a healthier church, spiritually, aren't we? So this is, uh, this is all for you. And I'm excited for what we're going to be able to do with this to help us not only just us personally grow, but if you also end up joining this 2020 uh, home group vision, now you have a resource to help you to spend time with people and help them grow spiritually. It's just incredible. So it's a godsend. We're grateful for it. Thank you so much for hearing my, my heart, but really it's God's heart today uh, for, for Delaware and beyond. And I'm excited for what God's going to do. Why don't we pray together? And, you know, if, if you're, you know, one thing I just want to pray right now is that we would commit ourselves to be open to, to be used by God in this way. So let's pray that. God, Lord, we don't have it all figured out. We, we don't know how we would all do this or who would do this. God, but we are all called to make disciples in some way or form. This is just one method to reach the lost. So God, I pray you place it on the hearts of those you're calling to do this today. And Lord, we commit ourselves to go out into this world and love everyone around us everywhere. And then Lord, as we lead them to you, as we connect them to Jesus, as we show them our life and our faith, we could even as well bring them into church or bring them into our groups to help them grow closer to you. God, we thank you for these resources. We thank you for the vision you placed in our church many years ago. And now we're dusting it off even more. We're just refining it and growing it even more because it's been happening. But God, you're wanting us to take it to another level. So help us do that. Be with my church friends here, my, my family, the body here, be with them. And God, if there's anyone in here today that you are working on, I pray, Lord, that they would receive you, that they would believe in you, they would walk one more step closer to you to choose Jesus today. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing. We give all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next week.